Hi, in this video, I'll be talking you through some of the changes in the recent BNF. So since 2024, there's been a number of changes this particular year. So I'm going to be talking you through some of those important changes around drugs like sodium vaporate, for example, stroke. There's been major changes in the management of stroke and so on. So in this video, I'm going to talk you through all of those updates. Okay, so the first one we need to talk about is sodium vaporate. With sodium vaporate, as you know, sodium vaporate is teratogenic and it can affect unborn children, which is why it's important for uh, patients of childbearing potential, especially from this year, under the age of 55, to not be prescribed sodium vaporate unless it's the absolute last choice. Okay, so for patients who have epilepsy or other conditions where they require sodium vaporate. Sodium vaporate should not be prescribed to those patients unless it's the absolute last choice. So we have to try other alternatives um, before giving sodium vaporate to our patients under 55 of childbearing potential. Now, one common question people ask me is, what about children? You know, children who are sort of six and seven years old, for example, can they not take sodium vaporate because they're not of childbearing potential, are they? Um, and the truth is they can actually take sodium vaporate. However, it's not safe uh, for long-term use because those children will obviously grow up and become adolescents and adults. And if you've stabilized them on sodium vaporate, then you may have to change the medication again. So important for patients to be on something they can take for long term if they need it for, for a long period of time. Okay, so uh, another thing about sodium vaporate is for us as pharmacists to supply a full, uh, complete box. So an unopened box of sodium vaporate should always be supplied, okay? There's important information, there's important leaflets within the boxes of sodium vaporate that the manufacturers will not like us and the MHRA will not like us to lose. So it's important to give patients a complete box, even if they need less than the quantity in that box. Always supply a complete, a full box of sodium vaporate. The next thing we need to talk about is metformin. Metformin has been around for a very long time and we know for a while now that metformin can be used in the management of type 2 diabetes, including gestational diabetes. Uh, we can also use metformin to treat uh, type 1 diabetes now. So now in 2024, they've added uh, another indication which is for metformin to be uh, used for the management of type 1 diabetes alongside insulin. Yes, so we use metformin alongside insulin. So if a patient has type 1 diabetes, we can give, we can give metformin with insulin. Okay. So uh, this is obviously in addition to um, the treatment of polycystic ovary syndrome. So polycystic ovary, ovary syndrome is another indication for metformin. And so that makes it about three indications now. Okay, so you have metformin to the, for the management of type 2 diabetes. We have metformin now for the management of type 1 diabetes from this year. Um, and we have metformin for the management of polycystic ovary syndrome okay so those are three indications of metformin as of now reminding you that metformin can cause low b12 levels so if your patients are metformin especially when they're taking it long term it can lead to low b12 levels so always get them to check their b12 levels to see if they have deficiency in b12 levels codeine linktus codeine linktus has been changed from p to pom so codeine linktus uh, was sold over the counter for many years, but due to many cases of abuse, codeine linktus has now been switched from P to POM. So it's now a prescription only medicine. Okay, so for patients to be able to obtain codeine linktus from a pharmacy, they will need a prescription. This was done by the MHRA this year because of an increase in abuse and misuse of the drug. All right, so codeine linktus has been switched from P to POM medicine. The next one we need to talk about is pseudoephedrine. All right, so with pseudoephedrine, 
it can cause what we call encephalopathy, okay? So it can cause press, which is posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. If a patient is on pseudoephedrine and they complain to you about um, loss of memory, for example, loss of coordination or loss of balance, nausea, vomiting, things like that, then they could have encephalopathy, which is a condition that can affect the brain. Okay, so the symptoms I've just explained, I've just listed as symptoms that a patient with encephalopathy may mention to you, you know, lack of coordination, uh, lack of balance, nausea, vomiting, memory loss, you know, those sort of things could be as a result of encephalopathy. So, so the ephedrine has not been discontinued, it's still um, being prescribed and still being sold over the counter. However, the MHRA wants us to keep an eye out for patients who are taking to the ephedrine who may complain of symptoms of encephalopathy. If that's the case, ask them to stop taking the drug and refer them to A and E immediately. The next one we need to talk about is aripiprazole. So aripiprazole is an antipsychotic drug. Aripiprazole is a second generation antipsychotic, second generation antipsychotic medication. I actually like aripiprazole uh, in the management of patients. In the management of patients with um, schizophrenia, for example, because it has a low side effect profile. So when you look at the profile of um, uh, anti anti um, psychotic drugs, uh, both first generation and second generation, you see a lot of uh, side effects, uh, metabolic side effects, especially in the case of second generation, and um, other side effects in case of first generation. Uh, antipsychotic medication. Okay, so when it comes to aripiprazole, aripiprazole actually has less likelihood of causing metabolic side effects, you see. So things like weight gain, for example, uh, things like increase in prolactin levels, for example, uh, things like sedation, those things are not as bad with aripiprazole as they are with some of the other second generation antipsychotic drug. However, the new update on aripiprazole is warning all healthcare professionals that aripiprazole can increase the risk of pathological gambling. All right, so if a patient has uh, complaints of increase in uh, pathological gambling or certain types of behavior uh, that are sort of addictive, then it could be due to the drug. Okay, so they have to be referred for further investigation. Okay, so that's the main update to waive aripiprazole. It can increase the risk of pathological gambling. Quinolones. Quinolones are an important antibiotic group. Uh, they're obviously active against both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. Very important group of antibiotics, antibiotics quinolones are. Um, and for years, we've known about some of the problems or side effects they can cause, such as tendon damage, for example. So they can cause tendon damage, they can cause tendinitis, especially when you take them alongside corticosteroids, for example. But even without taking them alongside corticosteroids, they can also increase the risk of uh, tendinitis on their own. They can also increase the risk of seizures, which can be made worse if you take it with NSAIDs. So if you take one alone with NSAIDs, it can increase the risk of seizures even more. It can also cause bleeding when taken alongside warfarin, all right? So we try to avoid giving quinolones and warfarin. But now, in 2024, what they are saying is that quinolones should be used as last line wherever possible. So for the indications of quinolones, including the treatment of food poisoning, uh, such as, you know, the ones caused by salmonella, for example, shigella, for example, uh, those things should be managed with other alternatives if there are before going to quinolone. So quinolone should be used as last line. It should be used as last line wherever possible, okay? And this is because of an increased risk of aortic aneurysm. So we use quinolones as last line now. We look for other alternatives. If you can't find another alternative, then you can consider using quinolones, okay? So that is the update in 2024. 
The next one, number seven, we have 10 in total. Number seven is on B12, hydroxycobalamin. So B12, uh, like I said to you before, can be uh, low in patients who are taking metformin long term. A lot of people in the UK are also low on B12. Another group of people who have low levels of B12 are vegans. So if a patient has a vegan diet, chances are they're going to have low levels of B12. This is one of the cases uh, for vegans that we get in practice. Um, uh, in, in practice, so for patients who are vegans, they tend to have low B12 levels. So we would we'll recommend for them to have B12 supplementation, usually with hydroxycobalamin, which is the version that's available as uh, injection. There's obviously uh, cyanocobalamin, which you can take orally, but hydroxycobalamin is a better choice for most patients in the UK because it has a long half-life and it stays in the system for quite a while. In fact, if a patient has hydroxycobalamin injection, they don't need another one for at least three months. Okay, so they will just need to take this four times in a year. So every three months, they can have their B12 injection and they are good to go with hydroxycobalamin. But um, one all patients who have B12, uh, low B12 levels about... Uh, the increased risk of sensitivity if they have cobalt allergy. So patients who have cobalt allergy, if you give them B12 injection, if you give them hydroxycobalamin, they can have sensitivity issues, all right? So we always check if the patient has cobalt allergy before giving them hydroxycobalamin. That is the new update. I have a quick question. Someone says, would those other alternatives now be first line? If, if it's a question... If a question like this comes up in the exam, basically. Okay, yes. Yeah, so that's that's the whole point. If you have another alternative, use that as uh, a, a, a treatment choice before quinolones. Yes. So use that as a treatment choice before quinolones. Quinolones should now be used as last line. That's what the new update says. Yes. The next one is semaglutide. Yes. So semaglutide has a number of brands. Um, this particular brand, Wigovi, has been approved by the MHRA to prevent cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular events, okay? So if a patient who is overweight or obese, um, knows has diabetes, uh, has an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, we can use semaglutide uh, as part of our management to prevent cardiovascular events, such as strokes, for example. Okay, so this has been added to the indications for semaglutide. So I'll say that one more time. So this brand has been approved by the MHRA for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. The next one is omega-3. Most of us have heard of or seen omega-3 before. Omega-3 is given as a supplement most of the time to patients. However, there is an increased risk of atrial fibrillation in patients with existing cardiovascular disease. So if a patient has um, cardiovascular disease and you give them omega-3, depending on the dose that you give to the patient, because it's dose dependent, um, it can increase the risk of atrial fibrillation okay obviously you remember that atrial fibrillation can increase the risk of arrhythmias arrhythmias would then increase the risk of coagulation okay which is why patients with atrial fibrillation will need an anticoagulant so it will start off a whole chain of problems if they develop atrial fibrillation which is why it's important to um watch the dose of, of, of omega-3 we give to patients with existing cardiovascular disease the next one is stroke. Yes. So there's been a number of changes in the management of stroke. Normally with stroke management, we use BBC. So when I tutor, I use BBC for the management of stroke. Setting the long-term management. That's what I'm talking about. The long-term management of stroke. I use BBC. Okay. So uh, the first B stands for their uh, bloods. So we need to give patients who have had a stroke um, an antiplatelet medication or antiplatelet medication. Now, before 
this year, we used to give patients who have had a stroke just the one antiplatelet drug long term in most cases. Okay, but now that has been changed, which I've explained fully in a video on this channel. I'm going to drop the link in the comment section as well. Um, and so what they're saying is now we have to check if the patient has a high or low risk of bleeding. If the patient has a low risk of bleeding, we need to give them dual antiplatelet therapy. Dual antiplatelet therapy. Okay, so. Uh, one combination would be to combine clopidogrel and aspirin. We're going to combine clopidogrel and aspirin. Another combination, if the patient is not able to take clopidogrel, would be to combine ticagrelor with aspirin. Okay, so dual antiplatelet therapy should be given to patients who have a low risk of bleeding. So give them two antiplatelet drugs rather than one for some time before they carry on with just the one antiplatelet therapy. But I've explained that in a video on this channel, which I would like you to watch. And um, I'm also going to post a link in the comment section for you to watch it in full detail. Obviously for B, which is the second B, which is uh, blood pressure, don't give patients who have had a stroke beta blockers. We shouldn't initiate a new treatment with beta blockers if a patient has had a stroke, okay? It's contraindicated. They can only take beta blockers if they were taking beta blockers before they had a stroke. So they can carry on with the beta blockers they were taking beforehand. But don't start a new treatment with beta blockers after a patient has had a stroke. But we can use other drugs like your ACE inhibitors, for example, your calcium channel blockers, for example, um, diuretics to manage blood pressure. Obviously, the last C is cholesterol levels. So we need to initiate atovastatin 80 milligram as soon as the patient can swallow, all right? Before, it used to be within 48 hours, but now it's as soon as your patient can swallow. Okay, so that's another change they've made. Like I said, it used to be 48 hours, but now we give atovastatin 80 milligrams as soon as the patient can swallow, okay? So those are the main changes uh, in 2024. Um, the main ones, this is not a complete list of everything, obviously, but these are the key changes in 2024. Thank you so much for watching this video. You can follow us on social media, TikTok. I have a lot of educational content on TikTok. I also have educational content on Instagram as well. My email address is on there. Our website is on there for courses and tutorials, etc., etc. Uh, obviously, give us a like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a lovely day.